And I'm one of, one of the founders of this series and uh, one of his editors as well. It's the book. Um, and in the book series, we now have 17 books. Uh, the first was published in 2015 and the most recent being Ramina's. So just a very quick plug, if anyone's got anything they're working on broadly in the area of religion and development, then uh, please feel free to, um, to get in touch. We're always looking for, for new publications. So I just want to say a few words about the gap that this book series has attempted to fill. And then also to say something about the distinctive contribution um, that Rabina's book makes to this field. So we're going to do a bit of history, first of all. And if we go back to the late 1990s and the early 2000s, so this was the time that I was first wanting to publish in the area of religion and development. I was finishing up my PhD. I had my first academic job, in fact, at Leeds. Um, there was no religions and development field. It didn't exist. Development studies journals were extremely reluctant to publish articles on this topic, mistaking calls to take religion seriously for attempts to promote religion. And religious studies scholars and theologians had not themselves yet recognized the specialist, that the specialist and secular field of development studies was something that they could contribute to. There were a few outliers here and there, there were one or two books. Sarah White now at Bath um, had a book on um, theology and, and development. There was a 1980s special issue of the journal World Development. And I think in the year 2000 as well, um, in the World Bank, Catherine Marshall began the World Face Development Dialogue, which is now at the Berkeley Center at Georgetown University. So there were a few outliers, but generally it was a very hostile field development studies to um, welcoming religious studies um, or, or the contribution of, of, of scholars of religion to their area. So it was also this, this, the, the case that at this time, um, development policy and practice was, was very wary about engaging with faith actors out of concerns that this might jeopardize their principles of impartiality and neutrality, and that engaging with religion and, and faith act was, was, was more likely to do more harm than, than good, particularly um, where issues of gender roles and relationships were concerned. And this is very much the focus of, um, of, of Ramina's book. And also the view that modernization and development would inevitably be accompanied by secularization was firmly entrenched in the secular left-leaning liberal world of development. So that's a bit of, bit of the history. Um, if we fast forward now 20 years, we today have a vibrant religions and development field that's interdisciplinary and global. So, so what happened? What changed? So a combination of factors, as we all know, thrust issues of faith and the role of faith actors into the center of the development and humanitarian world, as they did for other sectors of global civil society and foreign policy. So the failure of the secularization thesis, the global resurgence of religion, um, so 9-11, the rise of Islamic radical movements playing a large role here, all of these combined factors very much led to a, what we might call a turn to religion by the mid 2000s. And we see this across all sectors of society from global institutions to national governments and, and local civil society where faith actors are increasingly part of public discourses and faith-based organizations are today much more likely to get funding for their work from, um, from donors. And in step with these changes in society, academics have responded with ever increasing numbers of studies on what faith-based organizations are, what they do and what their distinctive contribution is. And this I think is very much where this book series fits, why there was a need for it to specifically have a focus on religion and development um, 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 writing. Now, one critique of this turn to religion, both in um, terms of its scholarship and also in terms of its practice, has been that it's little more than a donor or government response to meet their needs, to better understand how they can better engage with or instrumentalize, if you like, faith actors to help them meet their preset northern development goals. And that the perception of the religion development nexus from the point of view of individuals and, and local faith communities in the global south has been largely overlooked 
or at least not taken seriously. So I think there's also a need at this juncture, and I think this is a limitation that many of us have realized, and, and certainly Romina's book fills this gap, that there's a need for a local turn as well in religion and development policy and practice. Um, and, and this I think is very much where Romina's book, so the title of her book, A Decolonial Gender and Development Approach in Local Religious Contexts, Understanding Domestic Violence in Ethiopia, I think it makes a very a distinctive contribution to this need for a local turn within religion and development uh, policy practice and scholarship. Now Romina's book also makes a distinctive and welcome contribution to the literature on gender, religion and development. As with the broader religion and development field, there's been a tendency within the literature on gender to import a set of Eurocentric discussions about the kind of role that religion plays about what uh, alongside what counts as development and progress and to quote from Romina's um, book she writes that many gender and development writers describe religious beliefs as ideologies or as fundamentalist expressions if they are invoked to oppose gender equality agendas and initiatives it must be entertained she argues that when religious communities or individuals fail to resonate with a program that aims to promote gender equality, as expressed, for instance, in the language of SDG 5, they may not be actually opposing the idea of a more egalitarian gender relations per se, but instead the metaphysical connotations that the concept has within Western epistemology and experience and the neo-colonial act of transposing this onto their societies as if they should be considered normative. She continues to argue that there is a need for theoretical frameworks that explain gender realities within local worldviews as inseparable from religious traditions to achieve a better understanding of gender relations and embodiments in societies located outside of Western experience. Now it's also common within scholarship on gender, within gender and development studies that we don't just want to understand how religion and gender intersect to impact on women's well-being and development, but also we want to be able to inform policy and practice. And, and again, this is firmly at the center of Romina's work in this book. She writes that as an alternative and on the basis of my overall experience in this specific study from Ethiopia, I propose that gender sensitive research and practice must be based on theoretical constructs emanating from local discourses, which should then guide practical interventions on the ground, ideally led by or co-led by local researchers and practitioners. So just to finish, I really want to underscore, and I think particularly also in this, this era where we're becoming much more aware of issues of racism within the development and aid business and the need to decol decolonize development, I really want to underscore the urgent need for much more locally focused research that examines the dynamics, for instance, between religion, gender and development and the implications of this for informing practical interventions. And I think this is really crucial, a really crucial point to finish on, that as Romina's study argues, as she demonstrates in her book, the necessity for developing interventions that are attuned to the local religious life and attempt to reverse pernicious social norms, attitudes or practices, in this case, in reference to orthodox theology and the local ecclesiastical tradition is clear, even if this might not always mesh with secular liberal understandings of progress and development. Well, we need to take these local differences and, and, and local discourses seriously. Okay. All right. So I'm going to finish finish there. Um, again, thank you for asking me to, to, to set the context for this. Um, and I look forward to hearing what Romina has to say about her book. So thank you. I'll, I'll jump straight in. Right, Lars? <laughs> thank you so much, Emma. This was excellent. I was I was uh, listening <laughs> uh, with great interest. It's, it's interesting to hear someone describe my work. You know, I've been uh, living in my mind for the past, I don't know how many years, uh, arguing, um, you know, having monologues with myself about the, the relevance of this argument. And, and uh, it's, you know, um, I appreciate it very much that you resonate with it uh, and that you think that, you know, it fits very well with the times 
uh, and it, it does make that contribution. Um, so I'll just jump very quickly to my presentation. I will share my screen. I have a PowerPoint. Um, oh, uh, Lars, I believe I can't, um, I'm disabled from sharing. Uh, if you make me a host, I will be able to share. Alternatively, I can also send the PowerPoint to you so you can share it. Apologies for that. Okay, yes, so now I can share. Uh, thank you so much, Lars. Lovely. You can uh, see it now. Lovely. Okay. Oh. Uh, yes, so this is the cover of the book. Uh, I think Emma put it uh, very nicely into context. Uh, it speaks to all these debates. And what I thought I'd do today, um, it's it, first and foremost a disclaimer, it's very hard to summarize a book of you know, 300 pages and a complex argument that combines you know, three, four disciplines in this little time. Uh, you know, so I wouldn't honor the argument uh, no matter how um, uh, you know uh, what I what I decided to include in this presentation. So I actually thought that I, what I could do today is tell you a bit more about the motivations and the background, and give you the background story of what led to this book, and how that background informs the main premises, uh, guiding questions and objectives of the book. Uh, and then through that uh, sort of narrative and narration, uh, hopefully the argument and the approach will become evident, uh, as uh, Emma very well hinted to. And then I'll very quickly look at the study in Aksum because this ethnographic study was really uh, the case study that allowed me to uh, demonstrate the argument, but also strengthen it and articulate it even better. Uh, and then I'll end with some acknowledgements and thanks, hopefully all in 30 minutes. <laughs> um, so the motivations, uh, I, I think this, if I would have to trace this book, I would go as far back to 2010 really when I was uh, a BA student in the United States with a scholarship. Um, and during that uh, period, I worked for economic, economics faculty at Bates, and they were looking at agricultural development in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, now, that was a time, as Emma said, uh, in uh, that, that the gender and development paradigm was very much internationalized. So I was looking at the you know, documents from the Food and Agriculture Organization, for example, uh, on, Afri on agricultural systems in Africa. And the gender paradigm was uh, you know, sort of the, the mainstream theoretical lens through which gender relations in agricultural livelihoods in these countries were, were approached. Um, and and uh, what I found a bit surprising was that the, the testimonies, the actual discourses of the female and male farmers were nowhere to be found. I kept asking my professors, but what do the farmers think? What do the men and women think about women's uh, role in, a, in food security, for example? Uh, and so that experience led me to develop a research project of my own design, um, uh, where I would visit four African countries with very different agricultural systems and histories and political contexts. Uh, and I would interview female and male, male farmers, primarily in rural communities and urban communities, to try and understand how they uh, relate to each other, you know, uh, the gender relations and the gender dynamics and what they think about you know, uh, uh, these asymmetries that the Food and Agriculture Organization uh, seem to place emphasis on. Uh, so I was very fortunate to obtain a Thomas G. Watson Fellowship, which allowed me to visit uh, Ghana, Ethiopia, Tanzania, and Rwanda, and spend one year uh, in over 60 rural and urban communities. Uh, and based on my estimations and interviews I conducted, uh, again, I wasn't a rigorous researcher at the time. I did my best. I tried to be ethical. I tried to be reflexive about everything I did, obtain consent. Nobody had trained me. Uh, I just wanted to um, respect human dignity and do things the right way. So I spoke to about 300 farmers in that year. And, and what emerged from that experience was that gender realities were considerably more nuanced, complex, and non-uniform than they were described in the Agrothan literature. Um, and also the more striking finding was that vernacular, uh, aspects of vernacular life, people's belief systems, people, uh, people's value systems, and how those influence their thinking and their behavior and gender relations and gender subjectivities was simply ignored in this literature. Uh, it was as if it didn't matter at all. And this to me evidence for the first time uh, a deeply secularized development sector. Uh, that was in 2014, um, 13, when I completed that research. So even in 2013, in the agricultural sector that I was dealing with, uh, it, it felt very much secularized, despite the shifts that Emma described. 
Um, so I thought I'd show you a bit of photographic material to sort of give you a better sense of what I went through and experienced. Uh, I had a lovely experience in all the countries I went to. Um, the people who um, I stayed with, farmers and uh, agricultural development agents were absolutely uh, uh, welcoming and, and uh, you know, give, gave me the time. And it was a truly positive uh, experience, which, you know, true, um, sort of strengthened my interest in this region and, and, and my determination to go back and do something more um, sustainable, I guess. Uh, all the people depicted in the photos uh, were asked for consent before taking the pictures as a disclaimer. Uh, and they're people I, I respect and uh, trust and uh, have, you know, I'm friends with. Uh, so they're not just snapshots of random people, which is a practice that I'm, you know, I think is quite unethical. Um, so the, the first one was from Ghana in Ashanti region. Um, what I usually did was to do uh, groups, uh, discussion groups or dialogical uh, workshops with farmers, male and female, sometimes combined, sometimes uh, gender specific, uh, to discuss how they understood, you know, uh, agricultural livelihoods, gender asymmetries, uh, you know, issues of climate change and various other issues that they prioritized and thought about. Um, I also stayed in various homes. Uh, this is from a female friend who was um, uh, boiling um, palm flowers to extract palm oil, and she was very curious to show me the process, uh, you know, and, and her role in, you know, her sort of knowledge uh, of, of how to produce uh, and how to earn a, a revenue. Uh, I moved to northern region, to the northern region in Ghana. Uh, again, I, have, I had some uh, interviews with polygynous marriages uh, in Muslim communities. Uh, the northern region is predominantly Muslim. And then I moved to Ethiopia. Uh, this is the, the first picture I took of the Church of the Savior of the World, Medhan Elim, in Bole, in Addis Ababa, uh, which is the largest church in Ethiopia, as far as I know. Uh, and uh, then I went to the north of the country. I visited all five, five regions, uh, main regions of Ethiopia, but I stayed quite a bit in Tigray. Uh, this is from Asbi Wamberta Woreda, uh, a market day. Uh, where I spent, uh, you know, it's, it's located in the highland, highlands, uh, and I spent some time there to understand better, uh, you know, agricultural realities. And then I moved to Rwanda. Uh, this is a picture from Ruhango district of a school in the mountains, uh, and uh, an, another photo of a woman uh, who was considered the poorest in, in the local village, uh, living on a mountaintop with her, I believe, three children, um, and, uh, you know, uh, which evidences that you know the very diverse realities that people lived uh, in these different contexts. Uh, I then moved to Tanzania, uh, and after spending some time in Dar es Salaam, I visited Mwanza City in Lake Region uh, and the villages nearby. And obviously, some were inaccessible. We had to take the motorbikes uh, in order to be able to access uh, the communities. And again, uh, we had conversations, you know, dialogical sort of reflective discussions with the farmers, a, a true privilege uh, for me at that age to be able to be given that time uh, and respect and, and, and um, energy, people's energy to discuss these issues and to understand and to open my thinking. So after this experience, I was entirely disillusioned uh, with Western epistemology and the way uh, you know, non-Western societies were depicted, especially when it came to gender relations, because I saw a very nuanced situation. I saw uh, families where women were very much uh, decision makers, uh, you know, uh, they, they earned revenue. Uh, it, was, it was a very complex uh, landscape. Uh, and also in families where religious values mattered and informed, you know, uh, women's behavior uh, and, and uh, you know, uh, sort of oftentimes served as a, as a source of empowerment. So I spent the, the next one year thinking, you know, what can I do to change this discourse and to set this epistemological injustice right? Uh, this is an international sector that has, uh, you know, is comprised of multiple actors and agents, and I can't possibly do something that can set this record right to some extent. Um, and in that one year, what I did, I developed my own approach, this dialogical um, uh, 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 participatory approach that I described that I used with the farmers. Uh, which essentially would use uh, cultural practices of communication and conflict resolution and issue, uh, you know, discussing issues in the local community, also to discuss gender related issues and to understand together how these might be resolved. Um, and I, uh, I will describe it later on, and I'll refer to it, but it essentially it uses a Socratic approach. So it doesn't assume that you know, but it, you know, you uh, serve as a, you are a student yourself and you're asking the participants and the interlocutors 
uh, to help you learn, to help you understand together. So it's a more dialogical format uh, in its essence. Um, and then I was very privileged to obtain the, um, a scholarship to study ideas uh, and, and MA in gender and development uh, in the UK. And this was my first exposure to Anglophone education in gender and development, uh, which Emma might, might know what I, what I mean. Um, and, and I was a bit shocked. Uh, it was one of the most frustrating years in my life, I have to say, up to this very day, uh, because all my instructors and peers who came from different international backgrounds, uh, based in, the, in London, although, although based in London, uh, tended to accept, you know, theories of gender inequality as universal uh, and as uh, pertinent everywhere uh, without really considering the historical and context specific particularities of different uh, societies. And when I spoke about the egalitarian gender practices that I saw, for instance, in my one year, indeed, four African countries or from my home regions, Eastern and Southern Europe, uh, I encountered silence. Uh, a lot of people thought that I was idiosyncratic, uh, or some people called me too intelligent, as if I was saying something that it was inaccessible to others. And I felt subalternized, to use uh, Gayatri Spivak's uh, expression, if I may. And, and most importantly, the gender theory we were taught was very much grounded in a secular logic and a social constructionist feminist metaphysics of both humanity and gender. Uh, all, of, all of which follow from, you know, a genealogy of philosophies informed by Western society's experience with uh, theological dogmatism, enlightenment struggles, and post-enlightenment thinking. Uh, and I just couldn't understand why this was imposed on us as normative, as if this was the truth, when gender and development theory was about questioning the idea that someone has the truth and can impose it on you. So I saw this inconsistency uh, that I thought needed to be addressed. Um, and of course, as Emma said, religious belief systems, faithfulness, and intersections with gender norms and gender subjectivities in religious societies uh, were not sufficiently recognized. It wasn't a point of discussion. When I spoke and told them that I, I, I wanted to do an ethnographic study uh, uh, as part of my MA, I received some funding to do that. Uh, there was no supervisor to support me in that research because there was nobody's you know, specialization in, in religious and gender studies, I guess, at the time. Um, so this is me the, during the year of the MA. I traveled three times to Senegal. Uh, it's a, a, to a village in Futa Toro, uh, which is called Guy de Chantier. Um, the, the village, I knew the village because I knew the mayor and he invited me uh, because he was very interested in uh, having someone who could help perhaps in analyzing gender asymmetries in local uh, agricultural livelihoods, but in a way that was really culturally sensitive. Uh, this is a Muslim Sufi community, uh, very much traditional in terms of gender roles. And he, he was very keen to ensure that whoever, you know, what, uh, the researcher who would, who would support uh, this project would be sensitive to, to these realities and, and this tradition, you know, the, the, the people's valued traditions. So again, I used a, a number, this is the, the, the approach I piloted and then I sort of strengthened in this current study that I will present today that the book is about. Uh, which was a combination of ethnographic research. In this case, I had very little time in Senegal, uh, but it was living in the community, uh, you know, under, uh, participating in the community life, understanding, having interviews with people, uh, doing surveys with households, and then combining with workshops with the community. And I prefer to do mixed workshops, men and women, because uh, depending on the topic, it, it, it was not very sensitive. It was actually uh, quite, um, uh, effect, effective in getting men and women to talk to each other uh, and trigger that dialogue. Um, and it was very, very, very effective. Uh, the community thought that it was a very interesting way of bringing them all together and sort of thinking about issues that concern their society uh, out loud, uh, which they don't always did. Uh, they didn't always do, I'm sorry. Um, so um, uh, that kind of strengthened my, um, I guess, confidence that this is an approach that might work uh, in order to localize. Uh, development, anal analysis and research, and obviously the interventions that follow subsequently. Um, so the guiding questions uh, of this book, as Emma said, uh, the book is informed by this, you know, my, the overall experiences I've had. But as I went uh, more closely into the gender and development literature and looked closely at the metaphysics of humanity and gender that I referred to, uh, it became clear that um, the paradigm of gender and development, uh, which followed uh, other paradigms, the women and development paradigm and 
earlier than that, the women in development paradigm, uh, leading, you know, um, tracing back to the 19, late 1970s, early 1980s, um, had been institutionalized and had been universalized. Uh, but whereas the wheat and what paradigms had been criticized uh, for various reasons, uh, even from more decolonial perspectives in recent years, the gender and development paradigm, uh, which has been internationalized since the 1990s, and it places more emphasis on gender relations, you know, the relationality really aspect uh, that was omitted in the previous paradigms. The previous paradigms tended to look only at women and oftentimes miss the relationship with the males and the, the other stakeholders in the community. Whereas the gender and development paradigm placed much more emphasis on that relationality factor. Uh, and also the, ne the necessity of contextualizing gender relations in the wider sociocultural system. However, in its internationalization, very little discussion had occurred on how gender sensitive researchers and practitioners who wanted to do research in a non-local context, such as my case, should account for belief for local belief and knowledge systems in the gender analysis theorization and sensitization process. There wasn't really any discussion about the ethical, the epistemological problems uh, of this, you know, of this task, uh, which can be actually very, very challenging. Um, so despite a lot of critique around gender mainstreaming in recent years, uh, because it has been co-opted, uh, because uh, you know, it places emphasis on um, the bodies of men, so looking at how male and female relate to each other as opposed to how men and women in the locals as understood in the local sociocultural context uh, relate to each other and various other critiques, Actually, um, these critiques have not really come uh, been informed uh, by epistemological concerns such as the ones that I outlined. Um, so the, you know, the, the idea of gender, for example, or the concept of gender or the concept of gender equality uh, hasn't been really deconstructed and problematized uh, on the basis of the metaphysical assumptions, the fundamental assumptions it makes about what constitutes a human being or what constitutes gender identity, because these concepts differ in each cultural uh, system and its belief system and knowledge system. So my argument is that because this hasn't happened, these concepts uh, tend to not provide us with a complete understanding of gender related issues uh, in contexts that are not Western and especially non-secular worldviews. Uh, and uh, the question really that I ask and that needs that, that I suggest needs more uh, consideration and, and, um, and attention is, and I'll read out loud, how to achieve gender sensitive research in a way that recognizes diversity of thought and worldviews around gender normativity, diverse gender realities and modes of gender subjectivity, and that engages with this diversity throughout the process of research conceptualization, implementation, and diffusion. And this, this question obviously is informed by my own research, but it's also informed by critiques uh, by previous African and Asian and very other uh, many other non-Western scholars, including Oyeyumi Oyeronke, Sabah Mahmoud, uh, Filomena Chomastedi, uh, Ukiru Nuzengu, uh, all, all, all of whom have criticized uh, gender theorizations and their sort of universalist or essentialist application uh, cross-culturally from different perspectives, uh, but they all inform the kind of questions that I'm asking in this in this in this book. Um, so. Uh, Oh, apologies. So the, the, the objectives of, of the book, really, if I, if I list them uh, very briefly, is to evidence the need to suspend generic theoretical frameworks, because these generic theoretical frameworks are never generic. They're all grounded in certain metaphysics of humanity and gender that tend to be uh, informed by Western societies' experience, because these societies have been most prominent, not only due to colonial histories, but also to material inequality. Uh, knowledge production is usually uh, dictated by these societies, high income societies that have, you know, uh, the material benefit of creating and publishing knowledge. Um, and to emphasize the need of bringing, uh, of bri bridging theory uh, in development, in gender and development and practice with the lived experiences of local communities uh, with, uh, you know, locally um, grounded uh, studies that understand local issues and their gender dimensions uh, through people's own conceptual repertoires, through the concepts, the language uh, and the terms and the concepts that people themselves uh, use. Um, so the underlying argument here is that theory should not be a telos in itself, which I'll come back to, but it should emerge from the ground up as Emma read in the excerpt uh, earlier. 
and also to draw attention to the importance of epistemological situatedness uh, and to render the positionality of the researcher or practitioner visible in the research process uh, by cultivating self-awareness, self-awareness of one's subjectivity and the biases that this subjectivity implies and how these biases then inform research and shape the research process and one's relationship to one's interlocutors. And finally, to integrate the process of linguistic and cultural translation, what I understand as linguistic and cultural translation into development analysis and practice. It, I, I really want to make this emphasis and, and the book does demonstrate it as you go through the, the ethnographic chapters and how I struggled with my subjectivity within this research and communication with the participants that framing research, communicating with interlocutors of different positionalities than your own and translating data uh, entails many subjective decisions and interpretations. And these have to be made part of the research. They have, they need to be made visible in the research process so that the reader uh, can actually appraise the research for what it is. Apologies. Um, the other uh, critique or the other sort of um, focus area in this, in this book that I um, sort of undertake to scrutinize is the paradigm of gender-based violence, since uh, my research is focusing on domestic violence. Most of the research that occurs on domestic violence in low and middle income countries uh, is approached through the gender-based violence uh, paradigm. Now this paradigm, so that's mostly studies in global health and gender and development. Now, this paradigm essentially is not just a concept, it's an etiology. It's an explanation of why domestic violence occurs in this context. And usually it favors uh, gender parameters as explanatory factors, so gender asymmetries, gender norms, uh, and various other um, gender-related uh, factors. And it's usually applied uh, through a sociological methodology. So essentially it's a theory that is then applied to the low and middle income context of study each time. However, this happens oftentimes, and most, in most cases, without demonstrating why the theory is relevant in that context uh, before applying it. It's not grounded in ethnographic studies that actually demonstrate uh, how uh, wider belief systems, gender norms, social norms, and human behavior relate to each other. Uh, so actually we, we lack the evidence that shows the causal mechanisms and the relationships between these different parameters to be able to say that yes, is gender inequality or yes, is gender asymmetries that causes domestic violence. That statement is very strong and is very hard to make without that evidence in place. Moreover, most of the GB literature has focused historically on women, marginalizing men. And as most of you know, the majority uh, of the perpetrators are, are, are males. Um, and although the trend has started to change, um, the, uh, the, we still lack studies that get, again, that place the motivations of the perpetrators within their wider sociocultural belief systems, uh, psychological parameters, you know, and, and, and various other um, uh, uh, relationships that are important to account for. And finally, and most importantly, uh, this etiology, again, being informed by a feminist theory that is very highly political, right? Uh, it has a tendency to universalize gender hierarchies. It assumes that these gender hierarchies exist as, as, per, the, as per the theory. And it tends to appraise cultural and religious institutions as loci of female subordination contributing to women's abuse. Now, of course, this does happen to some extent and in some aspects, but it, it, it monolithically also misrepresents the importance that religious or the role that religious traditions and religious belief systems have in these societies. And also it doesn't allow us to appreciate the potential resourcefulness of religious traditions and beliefs and values uh, or spirituality, the, the importance that spirituality has for individuals. And, and, and another um, critique that I have that, that um, I wanted to, to mention is what I discern and what uh, as a double standard really in domestic violence research internationally, uh, most of the research on domestic violence in North America and Western Europe uses a combination of theoretical paradigms, uh, whether it is family studies paradigms, feminist studies, psychological theories of violence, uh, and integrates these different explanatory factors to make sense of the phenomenon, okay? Much of this literature pays enough at attention to psychological and intergenerational parameters of violence, and also uh, personality disorders. So it looks at the personality of the perpetrator. When um, research is conducted in low and middle income countries, however, most of the analytical frameworks used to understand domestic violence are usually feminist or socio, uh, social uh, theories of domestic violence. So usually the fault, the, the, um, the cause of the domestic violence are cultural or sociological etiologies. 
Um, and, and these, again, are not demonstrated. They're, they're usually assumed on the basis of certain uh, indicators. So I'm asking here, uh, based uh, uh, relying on, on, on the previous work of Uma Narayan and Letty Lobb, is this stubborn emphasis on cultural and sociological explanations of domestic violence or intimate partner violence uh, in low and middle income context, a continuation of historical racist beliefs in Anglo-American literature about less civilized cultures. Uh, there used to be historically this belief that African cultures are inherently more violent, for example. When I see that these paradigms, these cultural explanations continue and there is this stubborn insistence and neglect of psychological theories of violence, for example, I feel that there is enough uh, indication that, that, that these racist beliefs do continue. Um, and finally, the, the book speaks to some problematic tendencies in religious studies. This is the other field I'm based in, uh, that Emma is also based in. Um, as Emma said, the, the mainstream epistemology around religion, which is a 19th century construct, uh, emerges as, as the product of Western societies, you know, distinct experiences uh, with Western Christianity, as I said, theological dogmatism, the co-option of theology by politics, and then subsequent enlightenment movements to liberate the mind from theology uh, and, and, and um, you know, the public life uh, from religion um, made it necessary to actually reconceptualize how we do religious studies in non-Western contexts who did not go through these experiences, who did not, uh, you know, um, uh, did not go through this genealogy of thinking around religion and the same um, uh, demarcation between religion and public life. And while some scholars have, uh, and anthropologists uh, have uh, noted now, have understood the necessity of actually integrating theological parameters in uh, ethnographic religious studies, for example, there's still uh, a debate, an ongoing debate of how that integration should happen, uh, how it could be achieved in a, in a most fruitful manner. Because again, in this epistemology in religious studies, the field has been sort of stigmatized by what used to be um, a confessionalist approach to religious studies, whereby the theorist uh, experience with Western Christianity sort of dictated how they approached other religious systems. And so there is this fear that once you engage with theology, you will succumb to the same confessionalist tendencies. However, again, I argue that one should decolonize themselves from these fears, because again, they're informed and grounded very much in Western epistemology. So we need another way to engage with theology that is actually relevant to the societies we deal with. And finally, in gender and religious studies, specifically a subfield of religious studies, um, most of the, ge the gender lens that is being used as an analytical framework is informed primarily by what, what is known as a feminist hermeneutics of suspicion, uh, which uh, traces to uh, Western feminist critiques of biblical traditions in these societies. And so there is a tendency actually uh, for um, any religious tradition that seems to be patriarchal or have similarities, you know, with what is considered patriarchal Western Christianity to be considered inherently uh, sexist, or, uh, hierarchical and, and pernicious to women. So there isn't really an openness, uh, although there, there have been critical thinkers in this field who have suggested a more sort of phenomenological approach, uh, which I actually find inadequate and I suggest something uh, a bit more different. Uh, but, but generally the field lacks this reflexivity, especially when they deal with Christianities that are not Western Christianities, so Eastern Christianities, Oriental Orthodox Christianities and so forth. Um, so the, the approach that I, I'm suggesting and that I um, sort of um, applied by doing the research in Aksum, in Ethiopia, uh, following this approach, uh, I, I essentially I combined, as I said, feminist oh, apologies, with feminist epistemologies and fundamental approaches in religious studies to propose a theology informed participatory ethnographic approach that pays due attention to the process of linguistic and cultural translation in view of the personal identity of the researcher. So the attempt was to do a multidimensional study that accounted for all these parameters simultaneously while making my subjectivity and my biases apparent. Uh, and challenge those throughout the research process. Um, first and foremost, the study used a gender-sensitive approach that suspended preconceiving gender, what gender might mean, and how gender relations should be defined, uh, religion or domestic violence, and actually um, worked from within the discourses of the participants, how they understood these concepts, how they invoked uh, you know, different other concepts to, to speak uh, around these themes. Um, and I paired, again, aware of the colonial legacies of anthropology as a field, 
Uh, I paired the ethnographic study uh, with the participatory workshops that I mentioned, again, which follow a Socratic dialogical approach. So it's about me acting as a, as a someone who asks questions really in order to learn and to understand as opposed to telling people what to think or to say. Um, and that meant uh, in the book, and as you'll see, uh, especially in chapter two, um, uh, discussing thoroughly the process of language learning, engaging with local languages, communication challenges, and how the research communication how, um, happened, the framing of the questions, and also discussing biases of subjectivity and how those were dealt with in the research uh, process. And finally, as I said, a theology-informed analysis of the local religious tradition uh, that uh, approaches uh, you know, the local religious system in its historical context, understands um, you know, how the insiders, whether theologians uh, or clergy understand it, and also juxtaposes this to the lived experience of, of the communities because these don't overlap. Um, and I just wanted to read very quickly an excerpt from the book on this, which is quite, quite telling. Um, my decision to suspend definitions of gender, religion, and conjugal abuse reflected a more fundamental problematization of the implicit basic Western logic dictating the production of universal definitions and theories. If the aim of theory is to understand issue, issues in their local manifestations and to help to redress those, and given that each local context is uniquely configured and requires its own analytical framework without suggesting that non-local forces are at play, the need for universal theory seems to become secondary. This is not to oppose cross-cultural theoretical exchanges or comparative studies for di from diverse contexts, but to redirect attention away from theory as an interrogated assumption or telos in itself to theory as a means to an end that acquires substance in relation to a specific context and an objective informed by practical needs. In other words, uh, my concern here is to problematize this idea belief that there is value in theory itself, uh, understanding that genetic theory can capture the diversity of the world and help us understand the diversity of the world. So actually, theory should always be guided by practical needs uh, as informed by specific contexts. This is really the, 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 at the heart of the argument of this book. So just before I end, I wanted to very briefly say something about the study in Aksum. Um, the study in Aksum was instigated by the same tendencies uh, in gender-based violence scholarship, uh, which replicate in this scholarship in Ethiopia, uh, but also by reports that uh, significant numbers of men and women across the country uh, justified wife hitting in some gendered situations. For example, when the woman neglected the, ch the children or she left the house without the permission of the husband and so forth, although the percentages have uh, declined over time. And, um, and, and the lack of studies to actually contextualize this attitude uh, I, uh, you know, having an Eastern Orthodox background, which I will mention in the next slide, uh, I was quite curious how, for example, a society like Aksum, uh, embedded in this Ethiopian Orthodox Tawahida tradition that uh, teaches about loving relationship and peaceful relationships in marriage, could actually tolerate these attitudes. How could, you know, uh, Orthodox believers have this kind of attitude? That was my question, which is a fair question to ask. And I just wanted to contextualize these attitudes and understand them from within the local religious cultural context. Um, and, uh, and, and there was also in the studies that I saw uh, very little engagement with religious tradition and, and again a tendency to consider that uh, religious parameters were, were, were uh, you know, negative, uh, again because the church was presented as a hierarchical institution and hence because the church is hierarchical then the experience with the religious tradition must have been negative for all that assumption and to problematize that assumption. Um, and so through the present, what I do in the book, I present you know, ethnographic realities around marriage and religious living that integrates, uh, again, is, is embedded in, in, in the history of uh, the region and the history of the country um, uh, as much as possible and is theologically informed. So the study engaged closely uh, with, uh, with a list of uh, holy texts and um, canonical texts that are uh, considered uh, fundamental in this tradition. Uh, I have a list, um, I think I, have, I haven't put it out, but it's in the book. Um, and working uh, with the community, to, you, know, you know, combining that with an ethnographic study with the communities, with two village communities in Aksum and a shorter period of time in the city of Aksum uh, to understand how people thought about conjugal abuse realities and uh, to understand their attitudes and how their attitudes were informed by their uh, religious cultural background. Uh, and context, um, specifically in relation to their faith tradition as well. 
And I wanted to stand a bit on my relationship to the study community. Uh, one of the things I say in the preface, uh, as, a, as a coming from a decolonial perspective, is that I did not select Ethiopia as an academic project in order to build a career for myself, which is a tendency that I see happening. Um, the objectives of this book were informed by my own worldview and the contingencies of my life. Uh, it, Ethiopia presented many religious and historical commonalities with my countries of origin and residence. Uh, and I felt connected to the country. I felt that I had a common language with the people. And obviously, when you do ethnographic research, you have to have that bridge uh, to create trust and to be able to access people's worldviews in some way, to some extent. Uh, my family and I immigrated from Moldova to Greece uh, after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Both Moldova and Greece uh, follow an Eastern Orthodox worldview. So I'm raised in this background and, and, and um, belief system. Uh, in Ethiopia, ancient Christianity was officially embraced as a uh, state religion in the fourth century after the arrival of Greek speaking uh, St. Fromentius, who became the first patriarch of Ethiopia. And it was consolidated in the fifth century with the arrival of the nine saints, uh, Teshuati Kedusan in Amharic, uh, who were Syrian and Roman monks uh, who you know, came uh, from, from uh, various provinces of the Roman Empire at the time. Uh, also, Ethiopia, uh, like Greece, uh, well, Ethiopia, unlike other African countries, is skewed colonization, uh, but it lived through an Italian occupation in the late 1930s, just as Greece did in the early 1940s with Mussolini's expansionist uh, politics at the time. Uh, so obviously, uh, there were a lot, com many commonalities in terms of the religious tradition, historical background, and sort of, um, you know, people's, uh, the importance that the religious tradition seemed to have for people's own um, um, uh, identities and, con and, and, and historical conscience. So my concern was really to contribute, uh, my, to, to identify my comparative advantage really, you know, given my positionality, given who I am, what can I do um, and how can I do it reflexively so that I can actually contribute something to this literature uh, that, that, you know, can actually um, achieve to, to give a more nuanced uh, presentation of the realities on the ground. So how, where can I use my knowledge of Eastern Orthodox theology, for example, uh, uh, in order to, um, you know, contribute to this, uh, to, the, to the change of discourse in this field? And I wanted to read another excerpt, again, because I think positionality is very, very important. Uh, and this regards my own role, I say at the end of the book. As it was demonstrated in Aksum, the majority of the lay population was not versed in Orthodox dogmatics or exegesis. But they understood the fundamental premises of their faith and they knew and tried to embody uh, the standards, such as by trying to cultivate a moral and righteous character. Without prior exposure to church dogmatics and teachings, it is unlikely that I would make sense of my interlocutor's discourses in the way that I did. My background as an Eastern Orthodox woman was undoubtedly important for accessing my interlocutor's worldviews around the human personality and gender identity. The inevitable assumptions that I had as a result of my religious experience did not prove irreversibly harmful, provided that I reflected on and challenged these throughout the research process, abandoning them where they were irre irrelevant. My experience uh, stresses the importance of making the workings of personal identity as transparent as feasible throughout the research process and its presentation. So as you see, I've tried to be very honest about the limitations and challenge them throughout. Um, and just to break the monotony before I finalize with my last slide, um, a few uh, a bit of photographic material from Aksum. Uh, this is an interview with a monk uh, at a nearby monastery. Uh, this is the compound I, I spent about six months in one of the villages that I was stationed in. I lived with a, a female who actually braided hair for other women in the village. So women would visit constantly and that provided me a very secure environment uh, to, to build trust with women and to speak to them. But of course, the research involved both men and women and clergy. I uh, used the coffee ceremony to create, uh, not only to practice language uh, speaking, but to create context for communication, uh, sort of create, uh, um, win some time with people because the coffee ceremony takes time. There are three rounds in the coffee serving for anyone who knows. So that was really a tool for me to try to uh, build communication with people, especially with males. Although males tended to not drink coffee outside of their homes, uh, and with a female that wasn't their wife. So that, that, that was a limitation. Uh, this is an interview I conducted with a, a male, a soldier uh, in his home. So this is the inside of the compounds, uh, very modest, as you can see. Uh, this is me coming back uh, uh, one evening from a Machaber, uh, um, Machaber sorry, a religious gathering, uh, which were very regular in the local society. Almost, uh, I, I think in one month, I attended about 11 of them. 
And this is a, a, a marriage, a holy, uh, the holy matrimony, the sacrament of the holy matrimony being performed in St. Mary of Zion in Aksum City, which is performed only for virginal couples, uh, very early in the morning, um, you know, very ceremon ceremoniously. And so I wanted to finish with the main insights of, of this ethnographic study. Uh, for those who may not have the time to go in depth, uh, what the what the study really showed was really the complexity of, of um, you know uh, how gender you know gender parameters and religious parameters and domestic violence interface and the necessity to take a context specific approach such as the one I attempted to to take in this study. Uh, so very very roughly uh, there were the society had a number of gender asymmetries and, and you know gendered um, factors that contributed to a tolerance perhaps, uh, or you know, even some situations of abusiveness in, in the marital relationship. Normative arrangements and expectations around the conjugal relationship, uh, such as that you know, um, the, the man should ask, uh, act as a breadwinner and the female should always be um, in, in charge of the household. And that when the man failed to act as a breadwinner, then that would lead to conflict and that could use, uh, lead to abuse and so forth. Uh, the expectation that the wife should always um, meet the husband's sexual needs and not the other way around, and that was associated with sexual coerciveness. Uh, the idea that the wife should always be timid to hood in Tigrinya uh, and non-confrontational at all times. And then a more institutionalized tolerance in the police and the social courts um, that you know, didn't really follow up when reports of domestic violence were made. And women's secretiveness around the phenomenon. So obviously there, are, there were these gender parameters that were very strong and uh, important. However, there was also a plurality of norms and attitudes that actually contradicted visible gender asymmetries and pernicious attitudes towards women, including religious values emphasizing mutual help, respect and righteousness, uh, neighborly interference to stop violence, and even societal sanctions sometimes um, by the church and by the priests uh, to criticize the perpetrator for immorality or, you know, um, non-Christian behavior when they were abusive or, you know, uh, uh, were misbehaving. Uh, the most important is that many people in the local society, they differentiated between their focal culture, what they called Bahil, and the religious tradition, as they understood it, Haimanot. Um, and they criticized, they thought, many thought and many understood that the actual the cultural culture and the folklore traditions had deviated slightly from the religious tradition and were not always in line with the religious tradition. However, at the same time, what seemed to happen is that um, the, uh, again, people still sort of invoked the religious tradition in order to justify their practices. And, Every time uh, they deviate, you know, if they try to make a change or to change something, they risk being considered deviant or heretical. So um, there was a suspicion in general in this in this society about any change, any departure from the norm and religious legacy, and so that gave the illusion uh, that many of these continued because of religious factors, but the, the picture was actually much more complex. So obviously, uh, overall, the, the study shows uh, the need for remedial interventions that, you know, um, as, as other scholars have argued, you know, more awareness, more education for women, better legislation and so forth. But at the same time, any intervention has to be religious really culturally sensitive. It needs to understand uh, not only how religious beliefs play into people's behavior, uh, but also how religious discourse is oftentimes invoked by the laity themselves to justify practices and norms uh, and, and how then the, uh, religious, you know, theology, Orthodox theology, especially uh, the New Testament theology uh, that departs from some of the Old Testament heritage of the, of the local culture can become resourceful in this, in this process. I can't go in detail, uh, but the book speaks, you know, in very much detail uh, about the, the discourses of the clergy, what they taught, how the laity received those teachings. Most of these teachings were again informed by the old, her uh, old testament heritage of this tradition because the same heritage was very much valued in the culture so the clergy responded to the laity's needs and expectations because they were afraid that if they uh, changed something they would be considered protestantizing as pente which is uh, considered is threatening to many orthodox um, clergy and believers currently uh, since you know there is this idea that um, most um, 
uh, uh, Protestant people are coming, uh, uh, you know, are um, proselytized from the Orthodox indigenous population. So there were many dynamics very specific to this context that need to be considered uh, for any intervention that aims to be religious culturally sensitive and aims to work with the clergy together and the laity to change attitudes and behaviors and address these dynamics. And I thought I'll end with this uh, interesting sign from Aksum University. Uh, I found it in, in, on the campus of Aksum University. It says, it is a sin to believe that every woman is not equal to man, uh, which I think demonstrates in practice the, you know, the necessity and the resourcefulness of speaking in the, in the language and the discourse uh, of, the, of the community in order to communicate these very important messages. Um, and to end with some acknowledgements, I'm sorry, Lars, uh, I just wanted to thank, you know, obviously my three supervisors, Dr. Erika Hunter, Dr. Jörg Hausstein, and Dr. Colette Harris, um, who all advised aspects of this project and challenged me uh, to think, you know, beyond my preconceptions and my initial motivations. Uh, it wouldn't have happened without their distinct support. Uh, the funding support from various uh, parties, uh, the excellent tutorial services, uh, Integrina uh, and, and GUS by Dr. Ralph Lee and Berhane Wilder Gabriel. Uh, I should also mention Josef Mengistu, who is in this call, who uh, allowed me to be in his class of Amharic. Uh, thank you so much, Josef. I'm a <laughs> um, Addis Mesret uh, and Dr. Mulugeta Berry, who at um, Addis Ababa University and Aksum University, who allowed me to, you know, get the affiliation paperwork done and be able to do this research. And Importantly, research assistants, translators, and transcribers. Obviously, I had to learn the different languages and use them myself to, to achieve confident, you know, confidentiality in the interviews that I conducted. But in the very early months, I used, um, you know, I employed assistants and transcribers and translators to support me in that process. Uh, everyone, uh, you know, deserves huge acknowledgments. Abrahed Kebramethin, Kebranegash, Fitzumte, Radai. I don't have the, the family names. Will McConnell, Heben, uh, Goitum. Um, um, I can't see the other one. Cherkose, Esetikabede, and Rawa Yamane. So these are primarily students. Uh, some of them are instructors in Aksum University uh, who all had an important contribution to make. And of course, the families in Aksum, I know they can't hear us, uh, but I will be back soon so I can tell them in person. And all the residents in the villages who um, you know, were patients, uh, patient and open-minded enough to allow me to to live with them and to give me the time and energy to do this research. Uh, and shout out to my mother, uh, uh, Larissa, my father, Eli, and uh, my brother, Dennis, who, uh, you know, supported me financially. Uh, it was a, these were very difficult years uh, for me. Uh, and Erica might be able to say a word about that. And I wouldn't have made it without my family um, and their personal sacrifices. So thank you so much. I'll pass the word to Erica. Thank you. Erika, are you there? Erica. Hello, yes. Hello. Hello. Hello, Romina. And Romina has given us an admirable um, survey of what she did up uh, until she came to SOAS. And of course, the book is the product of the years she spent at SOAS. I think she arrived in 2015. And of course, the book is a product of those rich years of research. Now, when one interviews a doctoral student, one looks for certain qualities, and one is commitment. And Romina showed this in absolute abundance. And if I was going to describe Romina's qualities, it would be three eyes. She was intrepid. How many African nations, I'm sure she sat on the back of dusty buses, if I know African travel, she was intrepid. She's been investigative and she's shown enormous initiative. And this isn't just physically, but she's shown it in her metaphysical application. Her, in, in a way, being a little bit of an iconoclast in breaking the norms of uh, the gender bias that she has said that has been so prevalent and also the disinclination to understand the role that religion 
or faith plays in, in, in the society she has studied. So she has listened and she has learned from the people whom she spent so much time interviewing. And I know how hard Rabina worked under very difficult and rudimentary circumstances. Um, and, and, and that is also a sign of a scholar who is completely committed to her research. And of course, she has produced not only a brilliant thesis, which passed, with no corrections from her two very distinguished examiners, but also now a very brilliant book, which I am sure will have a great impact in the field. Zoaz's motto has been, we, um, we, we like students to think outside the box. And, and Romina has done this in, 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 in her work. I hope that she will open with her new fabulous funding as, as um, a future leaders fellow. And um, I don't think it even has to be future. She is a leaders fellow. Um, so she will open a new trajectory. And that is one of the great pleasures of being a doctoral supervisor. Now, I am not an expert on development. Um, I live in Norfolk, so <laughs> that speaks all about development. But um, I understood where Romina was coming from in feeling a community and understanding what its norms are and trying to convey that to a larger world. So all I can say is it was the greatest of pleasure to have Romina as a doctoral student and my fellow uh, uh, supervisor, Dr. Horstein, I'm sure would echo such sentiments and, that, uh, and she is a true credit to scholarship. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Erica, uh, I should also say that it's a great uh, honor for me to actually uh, follow in your footsteps because this is, of course, the um, the the second um, um, well uh, reincarnation that we <laughs> it's not just an introduction to the uh, to a very um, uh, well crafted book and the uh, crowning of a PhD. Um, period, it's also the continuation of the um, Center of uh, uh, World Christianity, because we're talking about um, a manifestation of uh, a, um, a religious system, Christianity, in uh, a, a part of the world where it's actually been at home since uh, the be very beginning. So this is not just a, uh, a, a, you know, one of the facets of Christianity, it's actually the, we're going to the roots of Christianity. Mm. Um, Yes, so um, I, 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 I could say much, much more, but I think actually our wonderful 40 plus um, uh, uh, participants should get the chance to uh, uh, pose their questions and their comments to uh, both Romina and Emma. Um, I, um, if, I, I promised to be quiet until the very end, but I just had a question to Emma at the very beginning, um, namely, how important you think the actual definition of religion is in, in what you said, because um, you were very um, eloquent in uh, pointing out the, um, uh, the, uh, the tradition within Western um, academia, which um, ha put the developing world into a certain, um, into a certain box, so to speak. Um, and I just wonder whether, what you said uh, could be applied differently uh, if the uh, if one of the decisive factors is religion rather than a an ideological concept or uh, rather than a uh, political um, set of beliefs. So, um, uh, so, so, could you just define how you see religion in in your own work? Uh, well, that that's. <laughs> <laughs> That's a huge, a huge, huge question. Um, I think I think definitions of religion are really significant to um, the way that development now engages with religion. And I think there's been a really big tendency to engage with religion as though it's mostly about beliefs, 
as it's though it's mostly about texts, as though the, the real authorities are the religious leaders. And again, this all points to this tendency to not engage with the local and not to take practices and embodiment and, you know, local knowledge, the knowledge of women who aren't represented in the public as, as significant in, in what we mean by religion. So I, I don't think in my own work, I have one definition of religion. It depends on the particular uh, focus that, that I have in, in the particular thing that I'm working on. But, but I think it's absolutely crucial for um, how development is engaged with religion. It's a very westernized, Christianized, belief-focused understanding of religion. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. So I'll be quiet now. Uh, and <laughs> we're taking questions and they can go both to, probably more to Romina, but um, uh, to both of our speakers. Hmm. Um, the, the way it works, you, you have to unmute yourself. Uh, I think I've given you the authority to do so, and then you simply speak. But um, um, we, yes, anyone who would like to ask a question? Yes, John Beans, yes. Thank you. Well, a question, Romina, really, um, looking uh, quite specifically about uh, looking at your work within the uh, Tigrayan villages. Did you have one of the um, structures that seems to be quite important in Ethiopian church society is the Mahaber. And this enables groups, you know, that the churches function much as organizations or parishes, but as quite small informal community groups and often these are gender specific. I attend on many occasions local uh, groups of, um, of entirely women mahabers, which is quite an, uh, a, an important uh, group which uh, gave, gave an in, in empowerment and a voice to women in communities. I wonder this was something which was significant in your own experience in the Aksumite communities. So, so John, uh, the Mahaber, I, I, I would think of the religious Mahaber, so the regular um, sort of gathering to venerate saints, for example, and other religious celebrations, or do you mean associations uh, of women that are uh, rural, those existed, uh, and also uh, associations such as the Adir, uh, right, for funeral support and various other um, functions. Uh, do you want to clarify before I answer? I think it would, well could include 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 all of those. But um, <laughs> I mean, I've, for example, intended a number of times uh, groups which would be attached to a church. Would be yep. entirely. It might be say a group of a dozen or so women who would meet once yeah. a month in different yeah. houses. <laughs> But the fact that they would able meet together in religious context mm -hmm. did give a kind of uh, opportunity for an identity and a place in society, which seemed quite significant in their lives in defining mm -hmm. their gender role, their uh, role in society, as a sort of you know one of your sort of local religiously specific. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think this. Uh, clarifies. Uh, so all village communities now have uh, a women's association uh, where, you know, presumably these aim to communicate women's issues to the Wereda office, the higher up administration, uh, and then the regional level and the state level. So it, it's really about uh, creating those um, pathways or conduits uh, mm -hmm. to ensure that women's issues are properly reported and addressed, you know, uh, within the state machinery. Uh, the thing with these women's associations, I tried, I work through the women's association because I was trying to build relationships of trust with uh, a segment of the population, and this was uh, seemed to be uh, the most pragmatic way to move forward and discreetly. Um, there was a lot of politics involved in the women's association, various antagonisms, various hostilities, uh, because uh, although the secretary of the women's association wasn't paid, uh, remunerated for her role, she was uh, reimbursed to travel to the city to be in the trainings and the meetings uh, that you know were organized at the Wereda level. So there was a lot of rumors and a lot of antagonisms uh, around the secretaries in particular, uh, because they some were thought to have lied to get that position. Uh, and, you know, people didn't have faith in the secretary. And if the faith in the secretary was lost, then the whole thing sort of fell apart. That's what, that was one phenomenon I, I saw. And I don't think that in the rural areas, at least in my experience, in what I heard from the testimonies of the different uh, female interlocutors, uh, that they felt that they had that unity as a, as a, you know, as females in society. Again, because there were all sorts of 
other parameters that created a, a sort of awkward dynamics be between people, gossip, political politics, uh, histories, family histories, antagonisms of all sorts. Um, so, you know, in the rural community, um, these things are very important. Gossip is very important. People are very aware of it uh, and they try to stay away from it. And that really determines the relationships of people. In the cities, uh, uh, on, on, in contrast, I think uh, these kind of associations are stronger uh, and more resourceful. So uh, I spend a lot of time in Aksum city with the Mahabharata Dusan, uh, the Sunday school department of the church. And uh, the women had their own group and the males had their own group. And then they also met together. Uh, they seem to be very active. They seem to share a common ground and understanding. Uh, but again, these tended to be women who had a, you know, a, a different level of awareness and a different relationship to their faith, right? They're very faithful women, but at the same time, they demanded you know, equality as they understood their faith, advocated and taught. So, you know, they were of, of a certain mentality that they had in common. And you didn't see the, that, that commonality in the rural communities uh, to the same extent. Um, so I think there is potential and resourcefulness, but, I, but there were definitely differences between the rural and the, and the urban context. Thank you. No worries. Thank you. More, more, more questions. Uh, there is one, Lars, by Gillian, I think. He raised his hand. Yes, I did. Thank you very oh. much. Oh, because sorry. I can't forget how to use the chat at the moment. <laughs> um, I found it very interesting. And thank you very much for your presentation and the work that you've done on that, Ramin. But I spent quite a long time working in Africa, though not at the level that you did at down in the community. Would you say that part of the issue for the very, very different um, uh, concepts and ideas that are going on from village to village, community to community, is due to the fact you rarely find a pure version of religion? Mm -hmm. I didn't find in West Africa, in Southern Africa, Central Africa, there have been people were really a pure Christian or a pure Muslim or a pure anything. They had mixed in to their religious belief and understanding long held traditions and cultures that predated any of the, the major religions. And that, that was what part of the context was that we should understand and, and so on. I'll just ask you about that. Yeah, I, I, it's, it's a fair observation. I think most of the literature that exists that is ethnographic and, and the literature on religion and development uh, suggests syn most, mostly syncretistic systems, as you suggest, uh, Gillian, uh, you know, an authoritative religious tradition that is uh, sort of embedded in a, in a wider folklore belief system. And, you know, you might it, it, um, sort of combine beliefs that are not necessarily, they don't necessarily trace to theology or, you know, religious teaching, but they are still considered part of the wider religious tradition yeah. and heritage. Uh, in Tigray, uh, perhaps a bit dif differently than Amhara region in Ethiopia, my interlocutors didn't refer too much on the Tsar uh, spirit beliefs and the Buddha, the evil eye, and various other sort of beliefs that... Uh, uh, exist in the local society. And, and I didn't want to impose that. I, I wanted to let the interlocutors invoke it if they thought it was relevant. Um, but when they did speak about these uh, spirit, spiritual forces, right, they always traced them to the arch enemy of Christ, Satan. So they still placed it and understood it very much theologically. Uh, there is a spiritual war fought between evil uh, and good. Uh, all these spiritual forces, whether um, instigated by human evilness, jealousy or whatever other emotion, uh, or by, you know, um, demonic forces, uh, they still fall under very much, you know, sa Satan's hatred for humanity, right, the child of, of God. So um, I, I think it's really how you want to see it. I, 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 I would think in, in most Orthodox societies and Eastern Christianities, uh, people wouldn't necessarily think in, in terms of pure religion necessarily. I, th I think, again, there is a bit, one has to be aware, uh, aware of the fact that our conceptualization of religion is very much informed by a certain conceptualization we have in this context. Uh, for many people, it's about uh, the wider worldview. As long as you follow the wider worldview uh, and, and understanding and the basic premises, yeah. everything else can be combined under it. And it doesn't mean necessarily deviation from the true faith, yeah. right? So yeah. it's, not, it's not necessarily um, a text-based literalist or, you know, very demarcated approach to one's religious tradition. It's much more fluid, much more dynamic, uh, much more vernacular, 
right? It's very much vernacular. It's informed by people's own experiences. And since religion or faith is so important, is a belief system that offers people answers, when they have experiences that cannot be uh, explained through common sense, then they will resort to their religious belief system to try and make sense of it, right? So I think the, the life itself sort of um, instigates or, or forces them to, to understand, you know, uh, the religious belief system in a much wider um, uh, way, I guess. So, mm -hmm. so yes, I think we see it as syncretistic, but the communities themselves wouldn't necessarily see it in the same way. That, that, that would be my comment. Yeah. Thank you. Romina, I have a question to you, although yeah. I, I made a vow to be quite uh, silent, but uh, um, when you talk about um, th this uh, religious vernacularity, um, mm. vernacular, well, um, but this vernacular, this, this uh, um, syncretistic uh, tendency, um, do you include the, the Muslim communities that you visited? Uh, is, is that the same, uh, do you have the same observation there? Uh, that's an interesting uh, question. Uh, I wouldn't want to take, a, you know, make conclusive statements again because my research with the Muslim Sufi community I spent time with was much more limited. It wasn't as grounded, uh, and also because the Sufi Muslim community doesn't necessarily represent all Muslim communities and Sunni and Shia traditions. They very much differ uh, depending on the tradition they follow. You know, the context and how the tradition developed in each context. It's very different. I think one cannot generalize. Uh, however, for the context I worked in in Senegal in Puerto Toro, uh, yes, definitely there were all sorts of beliefs, and this um, discourse about what is culture and what is religion was uh, equally pertinent there. Uh, so a lot of people would simply um, and and by the way, this is a Sufi tradition, so they will follow the teachings of a certain leader of the Brotherhood, right? So anyone who felt that anyone de departed from the teachings or or the the life of that leader whom they eventually Generate, uh, then they could say that that's not uh, what you know. That's not what they, the faith is about. So, um, so it was kind of very um, subjective to some extent, right? It was very subjective, uh, and there was an ongoing debate uh, amongst my interlocutors of what is l'interprétation vraie, uh, because we spoke in French. What is the right interpretation? And people had different um, sort of arguments. And then, interestingly. The people I spoke to in, in, in Dakar, in, in the capital of Senegal, they followed, uh, they didn't follow this, the, the brotherhood, the, the specific, uh, the Tijania, the Tijania brotherhood that I was, uh, you know, doing work with. Uh, they followed, I believe, uh, it was the Sunni tradition, but I can't remember which, which tradition, I don't want to lie. And they were, essentially, when I started to talk to them and ask them, well, why, what do you think about their tradition and what they believe, they would just try to, to negate it to me, to, to show me that it's the wrong belief that they're following. Um, so there was, as I, as I said, there are multiple understandings, multiple traditions. It's really important to, uh, to understand that context. And as I, I argue that one shouldn't conflate the vernacular, the lived religious tradition of the people as they understand it, with the tradition they claim to follow, because that tradition that they claim to follow can probably be traced to certain teachings or texts, you know, or exegesis, but that exegesis doesn't necessarily uh, reflect how people know it. And yet people will invoke it in order to justify their practices, even when they are innovations. And, and interestingly enough, in, a, in Aksum, people who uh, thought reflectively about the, even the, the drinking, drinking alcohol at the religious gathering, uh, a lot of clergy told me that previously uh, the norm was to drink milk, not alcohol. Now the norm is to drink alcohol, and both the clergy and the lady have to drink alcohol as an indication of, you know, hospitality. So when the host offers them uh, sua, the traditional beer, then they must drink it. They can't refuse it, you know, out of um, politeness and so forth. Um, although many people know that this drinking alcohol is an innovation, the majority will insist that this is how the religious tradition is in their context. Um, and that by invoking the religious tradition, they kind of justify their unwillingness to change it. And they don't take responsibility of the, sub, uh, of the consequences. Uh, a lot of drinking at the Mahaber was related to men picking argu arguments with other men or going back home and being abusive with uh, wives and children. And when I asked the community to sort of think about it and uh, you know, what would, what would the solution be then in this case, I would challenge them to sort of think, um, they would say, well, our faith allows one to drink, but to a measure. If they uh, drink excessively, it's their responsibility. 
it's the individual's responsibility. It's not the society's responsibility. You see, so, so <laughs> um, it's really important to understand, again, how religious idiom is invoked in people's own discourse, but also to understand that some people are not naive. Sometimes they use the religious discourse in order to justify and put their conscience at ease when they really know that that's not what the religious tradition is teaching, right? Okay. So we shouldn't look at people as naive. Uh, people are multidimensional, they're intelligent, they have incentives, they have emotions, uh, they think, as we do, uh, sometimes with their interest, self-interest in mind. Uh, and we need to understand all these dynamics, which are very, very, very complex. Yes. Uh, I, just tagging on to this, I actually just, uh, I, I only just realized that uh, uh, Mohammed uh, Gamal has um, put the message onto the um, system. And he asked something very similar, but uh, with more, uh, with a greater focus on the gender issue, the gender relations uh, issue. Uh, so I wonder whether you could uh, uh, answer Mohammed in that. Mohammed, so good to see you. <laughs> I also saw Barbara uh, from the Ginkgo Library. So Mohammed and I are part of a, a circle of scholars, uh, divinity scholars uh, in the UK and Egypt. And essentially we collaborate in interreligious studies, interfaith dialogue. So Mohammed is <laughs> one of my colleagues. Great to see you here, Mohammed. Um, I didn't, so the book is not about my previous research in Senegal. I have a paper on that, uh, but I do refer back to it uh, to build the, the, the argument and the approach, right? Because that obviously informed it. Uh, however, in the previous research I conducted, uh, essentially what, what the research showed is again, that the way women and men understand gender roles, and again, this is a very gender tr a traditional society where women you know, are in charge of the household, the children, uh, they're, they're not supposed to work at all. Men should be the breadwinners. Um, it, so, so it's it's a very traditional society, and and the way the religious the the gender relations are understood are very much grounded in people's religious tradition. So there was a lot uh, on the side of men when I spoke to them, young men actually, who would say uh, the role of the woman uh, the woman should walk behind the husband, dernier uh, uh, as they as they would say it in in French. So she should always sort of, you know, here, here, um, she should always consult her husband. Her husband is really the authority in that relationship. Then the women would say, well, that is the wrong interpretation because they don't, the men are not well educated. You know, they, they, um, they don't really understand what the faith is teaching. And there was, a, again, there was a lot of uh, sort of debate, which is the right interpretation. But in general, everyone um, did not necessarily challenge gender norms. They understood that the faith teaches that there should be distinct gender norms, right? What they would challenge is uh, when these gender norms were used to perpetuate gender asymmetries, right? So both the females were very critical um, and the males were very reflective and reflexive of these issues. Um, they understood that change needed to happen, okay, in, in the gender relations locally, but then they didn't do it in a way that uh, would abandon their faith or would subvert their faith, right? Or would subvert fundamental teachings of the faith. And this is a very interesting component because again, it shows that no matter how willing people are to change and no matter how well they see the problem, uh, the solution still needs to be very much embedded in their worldview. It cannot disregard their worldview, right? The solution has to come from within their worldview. I hope this answered the question. I, I just realized that we're precisely on time. I um, uh, I don't know whether Zoom will cut us off. It's a, uh, uh, since it's migrated to SOAS, um, uh, to the SOAS account, I um, I think it's become more flexible, but <laughs> in the when I used it as a private account, it was very strict. Um, anyway. Um, Lars, yes? Before you finish, could I just say, I wanted to say to everyone that I am delighted to hand the baton of the convenership, which uh, I also shared with Dr. Horstein, who's part of here, to Lars. It's great that the centre continues at SOAS, which of course has been uh, rather um, uh, traumatic in terms of its teaching of Christianity, but that we have the centre continuing is great. And of course, the support that you are all showing is great. And long may it continue under Lars stewardship. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, but I mean, what you said about uh, SOAS is all too true. I mean, we, um, uh, if you <laughs> knew how close we were to um, actually being phased out of existence, um, you, you would uh, um, perhaps sit there with um, a different, um, 
I am sitting here with a great sense of gratitude that we somehow survived. But um, I, <laughs> I am. Uh, I don't think we should take anything for granted. Um, that one aspect that was very badly hit was the teaching of languages, and um, especially in your uh, um, in your presentation, you you emphasized. Uh, the, the usefulness of mm. actually being able to communicate with uh, uh, local populations. Um, it, it's uh, it, it's a, 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 if I can just use that sign in the end, um, it's a sin to, uh, to, to, to cut languages and um, I, uh, for any university. And I, I think uh, the sooner we can um, uh, try, try to reverse this, the, the, the better, but um, it, we, I mean, the times we live in are, are quite extraordinary, but I think we should uh, keep our heads uh, firmly screwed on when we take important decisions. Um, and um, this is um, something that is probably not just going to pass uh, with the um, uh, illness itself, the COVID uh, phenomenon. Um, this will continue for a number of years, this, this challenge. So Lars, may, may I just say that there, Adisa had, um, had a question. He has a raised hand, and I wonder if we have any yes, minutes to absolutely. take. Mm -hmm. If Adisa is still with us, if he hasn't left. Yes, Romina, thank you. Hello, Adisa. Just to, to raise the question of how you, how you use the, the term patriarchic, because many uh, Ethiopian Orthodox title scholars argue that the use of this term is not proper and uh, there is also another issue where women are also taken as responsible for some of the abusive mm -hmm. panels of men. Did you discover anything on that? Yes, yes. So I did, I did not use the term patriarchy. I, I find it very problematic in the way it's understood in Western scholarship. Uh, I mean, I would, I would uh, understand it perhaps as a model whereby the male is the main decision maker and has the authority, but just because uh, um, there is a patriarchal model doesn't mean that the gender relationships cannot be to some extent egalitarian because it depends on what kind of relationship and arrangement the wife and husband have. So you might have a family that seems quite patriarchal in the sense that the male is making all the decisions and so forth. But when you go into the family and live with them, you see that actually the woman has more decision-making power. And, uh, you know, uh, so, so I didn't use this term at all. Uh, and again, because the way I approached this research, Adisa, was to use the terminology that people used. Uh, patriarchy was not a, a, a terminology used in, in the villages. It might be used by some feminist movements and women's activists uh, in Addis Ababa. Uh, perhaps by EULA, the Ethiopian Women Lawyers Association, or Setawit, and the the um, feminist, the, the more recent feminist movement established in 2014 that self-identifies as feminist. Uh, but most people are cautious not to use these terminologies because they can be misinterpreted by the local communities and, and stakeholders. Um, in terms of uh, female abusiveness, yes, indeed, a lot of people spoke about uh, cases where women had been the abuser. They knew by name people who, you know, these situations and case studies. Um, they had uh, this expression, kufwe, which means uh, bad in Tigrinya, and they would say bad women or bad men. And bad women tend to be, again, women who um, either did not meet, you know, their spousal expectations, they did not really behave as, as a wife should, uh, or they were very controlling uh, or speaking back, very confrontational and disrespectful. These were sort of uh, some of the understandings. Uh, but also there were cases of actual crimes and uh, you know, violent acts committed by women. Uh, in particular one where uh, a woman divorced uh, her husband and then her new partner and she returned and attacked her husband and I think threw him into a ditch. Uh, he didn't die, uh, he was saved but then they were awaiting the court sentence at the time uh, when I was in the village. So there are, you know, there are a, a lot of violent acts that happen by both genders. It's not one way or the other, but of course one needs to understand the story behind those, right? It, it's not that uh, simple. So yes, it was, it was uh, it, uh, you know, violent was not associated with any one gender exclu exclusively, but there was a tendency to uh, tolerate perhaps more violent behavior by the men because they were considered a bit more inherently violent as opposed to women. And again, it had to do with the cultural expectation that women should be timid, to hood, and non-confrontational. So by mm. nature, women were expected to be, you know, very, very um, timid and modest and peaceful, you know. Um, and, and so I think there was this 
tolerance of, of women violent, uh, men's violence and not so much of women's violence when they became violent, right? So uh, it was considered even more um, out of the ordinary, I guess. I hope this answers the question, Sadisa. Thank you. And, yes, and this would be the same in uh, Western civilization. This would be the same now if a um, woman is caught, uh, you know, killing her own children, maybe because of uh, uh, psychological uh, distress or whatever, the, the newspapers will not shut up about it, but um, you know how many men have done the same. Yeah, and it's a yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Well, I think this is all. I, I just wanted to thank everyone on my behalf, if that's okay, Lars. Uh, yes. Thank you all. It's been over the one hour I had <laughs> suggested one hour initially, but you can never keep these things to one hour. Thank you all for showing, uh, you know, showing up uh, for your support. It's been a pleasure to to knowing most of you really, I recognize most of the names, uh, you know, uh, colleagues from the research office, it's great to see you, uh, people from the scholarly networks I'm in, and you know, it's a pleasure. Um, thank you so much, I really appreciate it. And I do hope you have a chance to read the ebook, which is much more affordable. <laughs> and so, please send in comments anytime. Yes, Other, yes. Uh, also, well, thank you enormously, um, <laughs> uh, Romina, but uh, also uh, my, my gratitude to uh, Emma Tomelin, who's um, uh, put a lot of uh, uh, coherent thought into the um, background to this, um, well, it was a lecture actually based on your book, and um, the um, what I would like you to uh, do in collectively as the center members and those members who are not center members because of course this went out through Eventbrite and then uh, various channels. Um, if you're interested, do take a look at the center website, which um, um, I only just um, was able to um, access as an administrator. So I'm going to put on um, a, 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 a few sessions, uh, hopefully a good few sessions, um, over the coming weeks, um, uh, which will um, deal with Christianity within uh, the setting of religions and uh, societies in, in the present and in the past. So th th there are different um, uh, takes on this and uh, you're most welcome to, um, to participate. So I'm, I'm going to, uh, I, I should have said this actually at the beginning, but I wrote it into the chat, that this session uh, has been recorded. Um, the the uh, uh, clip will be made available on YouTube, on the uh, YouTube channel that we have. And um, uh, I'll be sending out uh, the link to all of you um, once uh, this has been done. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Apologies, I should have mentioned because I know the book is very expensive and I know that uh, Ethiopians usually don't have access to a credit card. If anyone wants the book uh, or wants uh, the PhD, for example, that I, I could share, I'm happy to do that in person. To, just send me an email. If the book is inaccessible to you, I'm very happy to facilitate that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much to all of you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank Take you. care. Bye -bye. <laughs> I'm going to disconnect you now, so thank you. Bye, Emma. Thank you so much. Bye.